Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, we all have a lot on our plate and everything from you know, our immigration system to our education system. Uh, as, as Joe talked about, uh, our goal is to make sure that uh, we can be an effective partner with you. I want to thank the members of my cabinet who are here uh, and members of the administration. I want to thank uh, Jack and Mary for their leadership uh, of the NGA. Uh, and everybody else, I just want to say thanks to you for being on your best behavior last night. Uh, I'm told nothing was broken, no silverware is missing. Uh, I didn't get uh, any calls uh, from the neighbors about the noise, uh, although I can't speak for uh, Joe's after party at uh, the observatory. I hear that was wild. Now, uh, I always enjoy this weekend when I have a chance uh, to see uh, the governors. As leaders, we share responsibility to do whatever we can to help grow our economy uh, and create good middle-class jobs and open up new doors of opportunity for all of our people. That's our true north, uh, our highest priority, and it's got to guide every decision that we make at every level. Uh, as I've said, we should be asking ourselves three questions every single day. How do we make America a magnet for good jobs? How do we equip our people with the skills and the training to get those jobs? And how do we make sure, if they get those jobs, that their hard work uh, actually pays off? As governors, you're the ones uh, who are on the ground, seeing firsthand every single day what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and uh, that's what makes you so indispensable. Uh, whatever your party, you ran for office to do everything that you could to make our folks' lives better. And one thing I know unites all of us, and all of you, uh, Democrats and Republicans. And that is the last thing you want to see is Washington get in the way of progress. Unfortunately, uh, in just four days, Congress is poised to allow a series of arbitrary, automatic budget cuts to kick in that will slow our economy, eliminate good jobs, and leave a lot of folks who are already pretty thinly stretched uh, scrambling to figure out what to do. Uh, this morning, you received a report outlining exactly how these cuts will harm middle-class families in your states. Thousands of teachers and educators will be laid off. Tens of thousands of parents will have to deal with finding childcare for their children. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will lose access to primary care and preventive care like flu vaccinations and cancer screenings. Uh, tomorrow, for example, I'll be in the Tidewater region of Virginia, uh, where workers will sit idle when they should be repairing ships and a carrier sits idle when it should be deploying to the Persian Gulf. Now, these impacts will not all be felt on Thousands of teachers and educators will be laid off. Tens of thousands of parents will have to deal with finding child care for their children. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will lose access to primary care and preventive care like new vaccinations and cancer screening. Tomorrow, for example, I'll be in the Tidewater region of Virginia, where workers will sit idle and they should be repairing ships. The carrier sits idle and they should be destroying Because here's the thing, if these cuts do not have to happen, I'm going to turn them off at any time. It's just a little bit of confidence. And do so, Democrats, like you, to acknowledge that Oh, 
over and over again. Compromising is essential to getting things done. And so is prioritizing, making smart choices. And that's how Governor O'Malley uh, in Maryland put his state on track to all but eliminate his deficit while keeping tuition down and making Maryland's public schools among the best in America five years running. And that's how Governor Haslam announced his budget last year in Tennessee while still investing in key areas like education for Tennessee's kids. Like the rest of us, they know we can't just cut our way to prosperity. Cutting alone is not an economic policy. We've got to make tough, smart choices to cut what we don't need so that we can invest in things that we do. Let me highlight two examples of what we do need. The first is infrastructure. This didn't used to be a partisan issue. I don't know when exactly that happened. It should be a no-brainer. Businesses are not going to set up shop in places where roads and bridges and ports and schools are falling apart. They're going to open their doors wherever they can connect the best transportation and communications networks to their businesses and to their customers. And that's why I proposed what we're calling Fix It First. I talked about this in my State of the Union address. To put people to work right now on urgent repairs like the nearly 70,000 structurally deficient bridges across the country. And make sure taxpayers don't shoulder the entire burden. I also propose a partnership to rebuild America that attracts private capital to upgrade what our businesses need most. Modern ports to move our goods, modern pipelines to withstand the storm, modern schools that are worthy of our children. I know that some people in Congress effectively, uh, reflexively oppose any idea that I put forward, uh, even if it's an idea that they weren't supported, but rebuilding infrastructure is not my idea. It's everybody's idea. It's what built this country. Governor Kitsap, a Democrat in Oregon, has made clean energy infrastructure the top priority. Governor Brownback of Kansas, a Republican has been fighting to upgrade water infrastructure there. And folks who think spending really is our biggest problem should be more concerned than anybody about improving our infrastructure right now. We're talking about the first major. We know we're going to have to spend the money. And the longer we wait, the more it's going to cost. That is a fact. I think Matt B, Republican, put it pretty well in Wyoming State, State Address. He said, failing to maintain our roads is not a plan for being fiscally conservative. Well, what's true in Wyoming is true all across the United States. And we could be putting folks back to work right now. We know I'm contractors are begging for work. They'll come in on time under budget, which never happens. And we could make a whole lot of progress right now on things that we know we're going to have to do at some point. This is like fixing the roof or replacing the boiler in this boat. It will save us money in the long I know that one of the biggest hurdles that you face when it comes to fixing infrastructure is red tape. And oftentimes that comes out of Washington with regulations. In my first term, we started to take some steps to address that. And we've shaved months, in some cases even years, off the timeline of infrastructure projects across America. So today I'm accelerating that effort. We're setting up regional teams that will focus on some of the unique needs each of you have in various parts of the country. We're going to help the Pacific Northwest move faster on renewable energy projects. We're going to help the Northeast Corridor move faster on hydrogen rails. Help the Midwest move faster on
because it's high quality early childhood education. Study over after study shows that the sooner children begin to learn in these high quality settings, the better over the world is she does. We all end up saving Unfortunately today, fewer than three and ten four-year-olds are enrolled in a high quality preschool program. Most middle class parents can't afford a few hundred bucks a week additional uh, income for these kinds of preschool programs and poor kids who need it most lack access and that lack of access can shatter them for the rest of their lives and we all pay a price for that. Every dollar we invest in early childhood education can save more than seven dollars later on. Boosting graduation rates, reducing teen pregnancy, even reducing incidents of violent crime. And again, I'm not the first person to focus on this. Governor Bentley uh, has made this a priority in Alabama. Governor Schneider is making it a priority in Michigan. Governor Tomlin has made this a priority in West Virginia. Even in a time of tight budgets, Republicans and Democrats are focused on high quality. Over and over and over again. We should be able to over do that and over and over again. seen over the last several years. To do that though, this town has to get past its obsession focus on the next election. At some point we've got to do some governing. And certainly what we can't do is keep careening from manufactured crisis to manufactured crisis. As I said in the State of the Union, the American people have worked hard and long to dig themselves out of one crisis. They don't need us creating another one. And unfortunately, that's what we've been seeing too much out there. The American people are out there every single day meeting their responsibilities, giving it their all to provide for their families and their communities. A lot of you are doing the same things in your respective states. Well, we need that same kind of attitude here in Washington. At the very least, the American people have a right to expect that from their representatives. And so I look forward to working with all of you, uh, not just to strengthen our economy uh, for the short term, but also to reignite what has always been the central premise of America's economic engine. Uh, and that is that we build a strong, growing, thriving middle class where if you work hard in this country, no matter who you are, what you look like, you can make it. You can succeed. That's our goal, and I know that's the goal of uh, all of you as well. So I look forward to our partnering, and with that, uh, what I want to do is uh, clear out the press so we can take some questions. All right?